Sziasztok! Hello everyone! This is the fourth MVM Future Talks Hungary's defining online scientific event. Very exciting, one and a half hours ahead of us. Join us if you are interested in uh, the solutions against climate change, what we're going to eat in the future, and basically how we're going to have energy to survive. One thing is for sure, Earth is no longer future proof. The real question is how much can it handle and what we should do to save it. Scientists in 2009 created uh, the planetary boundaries concept where they started to quantify human activity and its impact on human on uh, the systems of Earth. They also defined threshold values and by exceeding these threshold values we reached tipping points which could lead to uh, permanent changes. The bad news is that some permanent changes already took place. What can we do? What are objective is, for example, we can be, instead of simple passengers, become active participants in shaping our future. Uh, our contribution to this is uh, sending out six uh, ambassadors to take a look uh, at these planetary boundaries, look for possible solutions, and then we are going to discuss this this year, and uh, through this we try to contribute to the safety of our future. Practically, this is the animal husbandry of the future. As you can see, here everything is full of illegal waste dumps. This is basically sanctioned by local authorities by $10,000. When we can just change anyone's face with deep fake technology. Thank you very much. I'll take it from here. But the big question is whether we can believe our eyes. And we are starting off, it's really changed. strange that the steering wheel is just moving. This is the Orca, uh, the world's first uh, high-capacity CO2-neutralizing plant. And here we are generating energy respective of the time of the day through these windmills. From these topics, you have chosen and voted three of these topics uh, into this show today. These are food supply, energy, safety, and uh, climate change. We've uh, chosen uh, popular Hungarian experts. Uh, we're going to discuss these topics with them. But we also approached one of the most well-known uh, professors uh, from the New York City College, uh, Michio Kakutyaki, who is uh, responsible for string theory. And he is going to share his view with us today, and hopefully it's going to be food Hello. or so. I'm Dr. Michio Kaku. I'm a professor of theoretical physics, and today we are going to talk about my favorite topic, the future, your future, the future of your children, the future of the planet Earth. Where are we headed? How will we get our energy? How will we live in the future? That's what we're going to talk about. That is your future. From these three topics, let's begin with the first one, food supply. We know that it's hard to think with an empty stomach, but uh, we wouldn't have thought that uh, everything is working well around us. Let's discuss some numbers, uh, some horrific numbers. 1.3 billion tons uh, of food worth 1 trillion US dollars are wasted. No one is eating that. That's waste. That's horrible. In addition to that, 600 million people are starving around planet Earth, and 89 million people are dying from starvation every year. 3.1 million of them are children. This means that every 10 seconds a child dies on planet Earth, and that's terrible. Uh, it's really hard to face these figures. Maybe if we should learn that that facing this head on. Uh, it's estimated that the population of Earth will reach 9.8 
Képtelen mi billion by 2050, and we will be unable to provide food for that many people with traditional methods. And if that happens, then traditional systems will destroy our home. So we have to. And now let's see the ambassador of the topic, Rosina Vossala, who traveled all the way to Singapore to find solutions for food supply issues. Our current food chain could soon be the end of us. This is why we came to Singapore. Oh my God, it was so good. What is the code? I cannot tell you. <laughs> Practically, this is the animal husbandry of the future. This is how we will have protein. Chicken or not chicken, that is the question. She is with us, Rosana Vosala. She is joining us. Hi, Rosina. So what did you bring to us? Hi, Tina. I brought you a little bit popcorn. Wow, can you see that? This is so disgusting. Well, I'm going to show this to the guys. It's not going to jump. There's grasshopper. I don't want to taste any of these. What to do with these? Grasshopper. And, uh, uh, yeah, oh, oh, goodness, in Europe you this is not trendy. Eat it. Just like two million people know it. This little one, right? I like it a little bit more. Let me taste it. After two billion people are ready to eat it. Not bad. Not bad. Let's get closer. Come, come and, and, and try it. You want to try grasshopper? This one is delicious. This is good, curry. Grasshopper with curry. This is delicious. Just pass it on. Go ahead. And circulate it. Pass it on. Okay, circulate it. Ladies, uh, I just want to have a little. Rosina, tell me this. Why did you have to go so far? Why did you have to travel so far? So what did you find in Singapore? Singapore is really an insight into the future. Basically, they burn their own waste and generate energy. This is a city-state which is incredible. For example, I went to a bar which only uh, used uh, um, potato peels uh, and uh, carrot peels for for making their cocktails, and they uh, 3D printed recycled plastic, and that's how the whole furniture is made. Uh, so it's all about sustainable, but it was a very difficult choice, Singapore, because in this topic there are many uh, incredible startups and technology so solutions. So what you're saying is that you went to the future, right? So this is 2060, yes. Singapore. Yes, yes. Okay, in your life, to what extent you are interested in this subject matter, in your everyday life? It's really really uh, interesting for me, I'm really interested, but ever since I've made this um, uh, small uh, video, and uh, Very welcome. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity for MBM, um, but if we really face this uh, data, it's really okay, scary. So let's see the question. Uh, what are the questions to which you want to find answers today? Mostly, I'm curious to see whether the small steps that we um, can take are are enough, or if we have reached the point where we really need uh, measures and sanctions, or otherwise it will be an irremediable. Uh, whether we reach the point that uh, without uh, measurements and the restrictions, well, that's a big question. Yes, and our experts will give the answers to this question. So let's meet them. Ákos Sidakovich, environmental agro-engineer, population biologist. He considers himself a realist conservationist, which is why he believes in organic capital market processes rather than not-for-profit and government solutions. He believes that 96, since 96% of our living space is agricultural land, the key to survival is to modernize agriculture and drastically reduce the land use for food production, while urgently and massively restoring natural ecosystems. And now he's joining us, Akos Rivakovic, environmental agro-engineer. Hey, Akos, please take a seat, take your seats. Okay, and who is the next one? Who is the next expert? 
Horvath Boldizsár Boldizsár Horvath, agriculture engineer, founder of Farm to Fork. He has been working on organic farming and farm to table feasibility for years. He would like to initiate profound changes in the Hungarian gastro sector regarding the use of raw materials. His main goal and mission is to use a higher percentage of local, seasonal and organic fruits and vegetables. Horváth Boldizsár, Boldizsár, Horváth, Boldizsár, agronomist, hey Boldizsár, please join us. So guys, the biggest question here is that are we going to have enough food in the future? And what is going to be that food? So what is going to be consumed mostly by mankind? Let me give you a few pieces of interesting information that could be important for you. Actually, agriculture uses 70% of water and occupies 50%. 50% of the land which is inhabitable. So huge spaces are occupied by agriculture and 30% of the food is going to waste. So we do that, we produce that in vain. Well, lots of energy and money is spent for nothing. And as for CO2 emission globally, this process is uh, responsible for 6% of emissions. So, so how big uh, is the problem? And let me ask you, so basically, practically, to what extent, how much we need to be afraid of the fact that the traditional systems will be useless in the future. I'm going to give you a very interesting or a shocking answer. I'm not, I'm not scared with regards to whether we are going to eat everything. We are certainly going to eat something. I'm certain about that. And there are certain figures, apart from the shocking figures, which are uh, positive. So that population is growing, but it's slow down. So at a point of 9 to 10 billion, we are going to have a top, a summit, and then a new era will come about uh, where we will have problems due to the shrinkage of population. Uh, the issue rather is, the question rather is that while we are eating, how much we are going to put burden on our ecosystem. Because I, as a population biologist, the main issue to me is whether what's going to happen to us uh, humans. And here you need to make a distinction between the future of mankind and the future of the planet. And at the moment, the future of mankind is up to agriculture in 95%. So this is my Aspoitika Boldizsár. My question to you, to what extent uh, is this uh, food crisis a topical issue? What do you think? I fully agree, actually. I think it's a topical issue. It's a critical issue. Um, I am a technocrat. I have a technocratic attitude, and I agree. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying to be and remain optimistic. I'm surely we need to make changes in the systems, and the seasonality and the use of local raw materials is very important. That's exactly what happens in France, in the US. So that's one of the main points for change. So to import uh, massive amounts of food, um, like uh, uh, flesh, etc., etc., that's going to be changed in the future. Okay, when it's fl f uh, flesh and meat, let's talk about meat consumption. Okay, please don't shoot, don't shoot what, what have you seen in Singapore, but I think this meat uh, consumption is going to be key. I would like to demonize things and focus on certain things. I don't want to go on promote any kind of radical I don't say that everyone has to become vegan. Rather, um, I think about the how we uh, meet, where the meat comes from, how much it's traveled, and that uh, started eating religious pure uh, meat. Uh, children only um, for example, just one uh, part of the chicken, but we should have to start to eat the whole of the animal again and purchase them uh, in farms which are uh, only 100 kilometers from us, then yes. the problem would not be It's such, very important, uh, the radius and exactly the quality of meat, uh, what we uh, consume. Actually, the chef's uh, restaurant owner should uh, be in the flagship. It's very important what we use. So it's not just chicken brass, but the complete animal should be used and consumed. That uh, um, fast food restaurants have a 
large role in this. There's not as many chicken breasts as chicken nuggets. So that would be a very important um, approach to use every part of the animal. Okay, but here we are talking about meat. But there is lab meat or artificial meat as well. I wonder which one which one you like it most, which one you prefer. But Rosina, for sure, tasted uh, the lab meat, the lab chicken. So let's take take a look at the so basically footage. to grow the cells, I need that three items. One is the flask, okay, and then I'll put in the cells, and then I'll give them media, which media. is their nutrient, so that they can grow the fastest to and to the highest density. Media is basically the food for the fish. Yes, correct. For the fish cells, yes. For the fish cells. Yes. But at the end, we are getting a fish product. So mm. right now, if we look at a fish farm, they mm -hmm. are feeding the fish, little fish from the ocean. Mm -hmm. They're overfishing the ocean because yes. of that. Yes. So we can basically replace this little fish with the media. And in this process, theoretically, this is the equivalent. Yes, correct. So, so basically, then we'll put this in the incubator, then they will multiply, so they will grow. Um, so from 10 cells, they will grow to 20, 20 to 40, and you know, to 80, and so on. They double. Yes, they double. And then, Good math, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's like the smallest house, and actually then they can grow to a bigger house, and we have even bigger one there. Wow. So now, they are actually swimming. We just uh, train them to swim now. You're training them to swim? Yes. So cultivated fish needs to be trained to swim? Most cell type will be adherent in nature. And then, but to just make it for the efficiency of production, the suspension will be a more efficient, efficient way. way. So basically, uh, this is how in the future a fish farm will look like. Yeah, kind of, but this one is uh, kind of the smallest bioreactor. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So this is a mini version. Yes. But like if I imagine mm. what could replace fish farms yes, in correct. the future, then that's huge tanks just like this. Yes, correct. This is shocking, right? This is our world already. This is not science fiction. I'm trying to imagine that in the future, it's not agricultural lands, but bioreactors we are going to have. And how, how, what was the taste of the lab chicken? Well, the scariest uh, thing of all that uh, I chose this topic because I wanted to see uh, what uh, scares me the most, how, uh, what kind of a relationship I will have to it after uh, running this circle. And if I had tasted this product blindly, I couldn't have told that it was not chicken because it is chicken. It's made of okay, so you had chicken, chicken experience. Cell. It's the same stem cell. Uh, they create a, um, an environment for the stem cell that uh, happens within the chicken only in a laboratory. And if you propagate, multiply this uh, so rapidly, and it's meat, but it's artificial. Do you like it, this experience? It's I prefer call it uh, um, lab-made uh, uh, meat, uh, because it's not synthetic. It's made of uh, uh, natural. Many say, critics say that artificial. OK, we say lab meat. Is it a solution? Is it potential solution? And is it, it, can it be produced in any quantities? I think I mentioned it at the beginning. There is no one. Solution. So as Paul Dijer also mentioned that we need uh, systemic changes because not only meat is the problem, but agriculture uh, now and the whole uh, chain and the many, many hands through which us cause all of this global issues. So we need a systemic change. It's a very beautiful thought, and I think that uh, it can make uh, this kind of uh, lab-grown meat can make many things easier, but it's, it's uh, in agriculture, what kind of solutions need to be applied in order to catch up? I truly believe that such solutions need to be applied. I disagree uh, with the previous sentence that no drastic changes need to be applied. So I'm a population biologist. And in order to go beyond the planet and go to other planets, to other solar systems, um, the survival, actually the, the key to our survival is that we
we have less and less room, we need to step out. But in order to be able to do that, before that, we need to survive for thousands of years. And now we are at a moment that it's up to it's up to years, up to some dec decades. And if we, unless we carry out significant changes, then we may find ourselves into irreversible situations and processes. Um, and we will not be able to make a difference. So to this, these would be perfect solutions. So I support it, but I do not believe it, that this would be doable. Really, lots of problematic things. Uh, let me mention a very cool thing, or perhaps not now. Well, a cool thing. The biggest problem, the biggest uh, problem is that it's still technology uh, that is up to us. So practically, an embryo, human embryo, could be raised like this, and you could apply a clone, and you could have a clone army, right? Star Wars. We are talking about Star Wars. <clears throat> and really, this will, a lot is at stake, truly. It's amazing, because whatever you imagine will be implemented, because that's what humans are, right? So these systems, Bodhijar, uh, is it really the case that these current supply chains and production chains, consumption habits need to be eliminated? Uh, let me connect to Rosina. The long supply chains need to be uh, changed, short supply chains need to be applied. That's the key. And really, I admire those solutions. We must think in those terms. Local production, really, this farm to table, that's, that's, we should go to farmers market and we should support local farmers who really are in our vicinity. Um, and, and money is, is uh, circulating locally. Waste management, management energy management is uh, carried out locally and soci sociology uh, aspects need to be applied, etc., etc. So Akos and his um, uh, business is very important because they are trying to create jobs in the countryside, and we must think on those as well. So not just economic issues need to be looked at. Yeah, sure, but uh, this means that uh, we do not have strawberry in the winter, in Hungary at least. There are no uh, tropical fruits, not even apple, because uh, that doesn't really grow only in the autumn. Can you really change these habits now? Everyone is comfortable. Yeah, we have to change these habits. Actually, and we will change these habits because of drastic changes uh, which are required. Of course, I'm working in the countryside, providing work for the uh, for in the agriculture for people. I try to understand the agriculture from inside and uh, understand how to change that from the inside. But actually, uh, that doesn't really lead anywhere. Uh, we heard about the area required for agriculture, half of the area required for human population. That's too much. 80% should be given back to the nature. That's what I believe in, because uh, evolution uh, really fine-tuned our operation, our systems for one single purpose for the survival of the planet. There is a, there is there is a perfect solution created by by the ecosystem. Uh, this is a truly magnificent uh, system. We have to return to these ecosystems, and we have to return to the principle of conservationism uh, that. Uh, Humans should live in an isolated uh, spots uh, in the interconnected world of natural ecosystems. And I'm rather working on vertical farms. Currently, these are uh, about mostly vegetables, strawberry, fruits. Uh, but actually, that's only 1% uh, of, of uh, arable land. It, it doesn't really matter. So a vertical farm means that uh, it, it looks like a 10-story uh, building above or underground. This can be a skyscraper. It can be uh, on, on the ocean everywhere. And on every level, uh, we are growing something. There are soil layers, irrigation, light, natural, artificial. This sounds rather costly. Who is financing that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's costly and it doesn't have a purpose in its current form. 
warm. If you take a look at the figures once again, it, it, it becomes clear that uh, there, is, there is a terrible detail there, which is actually key to the solution. Uh, from this 50 million square kilometers, 40 million square kilometers are used uh, for animal husbandry and actually feeding those animals. Uh, so the uh, uh, food uh, requirement of a cow is four, four and a half times higher than a human being. This means uh, that, uh, that actually uh, we are currently feeding uh, additional people, basically, because, because of animal husbandry. Basically, we are, food, uh, we, uh, we are feeding, providing food for two times the number of humanity, while we are only covering uh, 18% of our calorie requirements demand from, from animal husbandry. So it seems that we are using a whole lot of area uh, for animal husbandry, while we are only taking a small amount of, uh, of uh, food from that uh, area. So here we need drastic change. Uh, politicians will, will ban this. Uh, and, uh, already, uh, Italy said uh, already, uh, no to lab there are meat countries like to, Italy to, uh, who are uh, saying no to lab meat, like Italy, Italy because they say that their tradition and prosciutto are much more important. Yeah, okay, so let's uh, take a look at uh, our expert in New York. Uh, what's his take on this? Is that the world population is slowly decelerating. Hopefully, we'll have a soft landing. We we'll hope. Hopefully, we won't have a crash landing, but have a soft landing especially in European countries and in certain Asian countries. And next, we hope to get a second green revolution, a revolution to feed the world. And like I said, 50% of the molecules of your body come from the first green revolution that changed the face of the world population. How can we get up to 8 billion people? People thought that was a, a, a fantasy to get up to 8 billion people. Yep. But here we are. And the reason for that is because of the first green revolution. And now with computers, now with advanced technology and biotechnology, we hope to create a second green revolution. That the first green revolution was initially a tremendous success. The world population exploded as a consequence. That's why we're here today. However, <laughs> there were excesses, specifically pollution. It meant that the nitrogen fixing process created lots of waste. And as a consequence, whole areas uh, were deemed uninhabitable. So we have to make sure that when we have a second green revolution using biotechnology, using genetics, using DNA, that we're able to create a second green revolution without all the pollution and with all the problems that came with the first green revolution. And so that's what I'm saying that I'm hopeful that we will be able to use biotechnology, computer power, in order to create a second green revolution that is non-polluting. That's gonna be one of the criterions for the second green revolution, which many, many people are working on right now. As mentioned uh, multiple times, the concept of green revolution, that we need a green revolution, but uh, the uh, uh, true question is whether uh, this does this mean a, a revolution when it comes to content? We know that we are growing plant meat in larger and larger amounts, but now we know that the content, the nutrient uh, amounts are changing as well. So the uh, nutrient value of a tomato is much lower than 50 years ago. By the way, uh, lab-grown meat convinced me also because it uh, doesn't include any uh, kind of um, harmful chemical that we are afraid of in case of meat, such as toxins, hormones, antibiotics uh, that are used to uh, grow chickens. So it's pure uh, protein, which uh, later might be even manipulated in a way to add vitamins as much as we need. 
need. So we will not need to take omega-3 because it will be in the lab-grown chicken. They can put whatever they want in it. Let's uh, ask uh, people here, the audience here, uh, are you willing to eat lab meat instead of insects? <laughs> not quite sure. That's not really a question, right? So it's, it seems lab meat is working. Who is uh, more on the side of insects? There is, yeah, there is one person I see. Actually, uh, the insects that I tried uh, tasted good. I think we, we have to get uh, accustomed to the look but I think that we will not consume insects in this form. It has a place somewhere else. It can uh, uh, substitute for uh, the cattle um, that, for example, the protein shakes that uh, bodybuilders drink there. I think it can have a... Uh, here we, we have, uh, you see a, a timer and we, we see that uh, some 26 years, uh, 37 days and so on. What do you think? What, what does this refer That's to? until I leave. <laughs> it, it, sounds, it looks real. Now everyone is going to leave for 150 years, right? It became a bit scary. But if you are changing nothing, then after this amount of time, we are expecting uh, uh, some serious problems uh, on planet Earth. And that's why we need a drastic solution. And that's why we have to turn back, get back towards nature. Uh, and uh, it would be a, a great solution when it comes to the nutrient value to use uh, crops which were grown by us in our backyard. But once again, we, we hear this terrible num number of 50 billion square kilometers. Um, and uh, now this means that uh, if, if, uh, if we are reaching 10 billion of Earth population, and if we have nothing else, just one hectare of uh, arable land, that's still not going to be enough. So that's not a solution. We, we cannot uh, turn back to, you know, everyone is cultivating their own land because simply the population is too high. And so that's why we need drastic technological new revolution. And once again, urbanization is something that can save humankind. Because uh, if uh, ultimately we wouldn't have moved to cities closer to each other, then I think we would be already done. So uh, urbanization is usually has this negative connotation, but actually this is the only thing made it which made it possible to be here. I think it's, it's key to actually bring in to us these solutions which we are using in the countryside uh, and move them to the city because we already destroyed uh, soil when it comes to arable land. There's no nutritional value. There are already some answers. So we, we already hear this organic food as a solution, organic uh, fruits and vegetables. Is that a possibility? Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, we have to somehow protect our soil uh, and, and be, be uh, climate aware simply. And we have to provide an opportunity for the soil to renew. But that's not what we are doing currently. Uh, because plowing and all agricultural activity actually uh, contributes to a great deal uh, of uh, CO2 emissions and uh, climate change. Uh, so I think we need organic solutions, but within that, actually, we need minimum tillage solutions. Uh, we have to do less work on the soil. I understand what Akos says, although I think it's a bit uh, far-fetched. I think we, we have to find short-term uh, steps 
steps that we can take right now. Uh, we, we have to get to farmers, we have to promote and support them, and buy from them who are protecting uh, biodiversity, who are planting trees and, and so on. And uh, from the top down, we also have to provide a support system, strong state support, where these solutions are supported. We should be proud of them. And the further problem is that in the last 30 years, more than one million small farmers disappeared from the market, which decreases biodiversity. And see, we see a large-scale industrial agriculture driven by profit. That's not a sustainable solution. But actually, we cannot get to the get to these back to these small-scale farming solutions because we do not have arable land. <laughs> ah, and we already had some key terms, right? Such as profit, consumption. Don't really get this because we have want to be greener, but how is that actually possible? How is that possible? Because these new solutions, technologies are more and more expensive. While people are looking for cheap food, uh, better nutrient values. And that nutritional value, the consumers don't even care about that, uh, actually. So that that would be a good state. But as Paul Honti said, business is business, it's always business. So uh, business will always be profit-oriented, and that's why we have to uh, make uh, sustainability into a business branch. That's why we need uh, EU funds and other um, uh, tax subsidies or other support. This that is very important. This. Yes, this is key. Politics itself is not going to uh, solve the problems. So unless food industry cannot see grab the, the profit in this, then we will have nothing there. But indeed, these new technologies are very uh, expensive. Uh, but these are uh, doable and applicable for strawberries. But for animal husbandry, for raising cattle, no way. Uh, what do I mean by this? So whatever uh, the cattle eat, so compared to strawberries, compared to other plants, uh, those plants require much less light, energy, etc., etc. So in the Alps, perfect green foliage could be produced uh, for the cattle. But what, what we are planning, and actually I disagree that this is far-fetched into the far future, I think 10 to 15 years from now we will be able to apply this. So, for example, there's a 20-story building, and there is on the on the ground floor there is cattle, uh, and then there is and the, and the, the top floors there is birds, etc., etc. And everything and the, and the floor is moving underneath them so that they can move, and the manure is removed and all that. And above them, 18-story buildings, various perfect green foliage plants, as if they were uh, great on the lands of the Alps, and one building like this could substitute for 3,600 lands. And at the same time, we are flying to space, right? So if you allow natural habitats to be replaced, then we will be able to solve the next subject matters. OK, we will cover the next subject matters. No, don't worry, don't worry. OK, so we are going into complex and very expensive systems, and we are talking about politics and legislations and what kind of legislations and benefits could push. But how about the individual? What can an individual do? What are our opportunities and responsibilities? Well, actually, I can just repeat myself. If we want to support biodiversity, you, as a consumer, as a, as a, as a visitor, should opt for seasonalities. And so in these activities, practically, we vote. We should be very conscious in what we select for our food. And number one, number two, we should support the local farmers who do their most uh, uh, for their lands, because that protects our health. A hundred years ago, more or less, 10% of the supermarkets existed, and of the diseases as well that are connected to modern diet. So I think that nowadays you go into a supermarket and 90% you will find uh, industrial waste and 10% food among the products. 
And I think we should be really conscious when it comes to shopping in a way that we can preserve our own health, our environment, and sustain those producers who produce nutritional value, because there are very few. Sorry, let me add to this. Uh, it's kind of not exactly right, because what we see and what we purchase is uh, invisible, actually. There are invisible prices, which is paid by others, for example, the health, the climate, etc. And 10 years later, we pay this to the doctor, what you saved uh, on the yes, food. Yes, and if we are talking about illnesses and doctors, I, as an individual, should request my fellow individuals to get informed, okay? Educate yourselves. And I see the farmers, small-scale farmers, who produce good food, and actually uh, they, uh, um, they sometimes use tricky things in order to make their products marketable. Uh, so we should be cautious here, and authorities need to keep, uh, keep an eye on everyone, including them as well. So whenever it comes to the use of pesticides, we need to make sure that guarantees are provided. So this, again, is is a double-edged sword. Uh, in summary, you should educate yourselves and be conscious, OK? Uh, so it shouldn't be like, OK, whatever you get in the supermarket is bad, and whatever you get from the, from the farmer is good. OK, yes, education and information is most important. So try to gather information from multiple sources. And that's also the most confusing Thank you so much for this conversation. Of course, there is an additional 5,000 questions. There is lots of theories, lots of thoughts, lots of question, uh, answers to these questions. So let's try to identify some critical points at the end of the day, and let's move on. We are going to talk about energy security. And again, we are trying to cover the endpoints. Hi, everyone. Those of you who have just joined us, uh, let me tell you that this is the fourth MVM Future Talks. Applause. OK, so our take here is nothing less but to try to uncover what our planet can bear and what could be the potential solutions to save our planet. OK, the boundaries of planet are in the focus. So the upcoming subject is energy and energy security. Very quickly, uh, let me tell you something. We are not going to deal with the necessity of decarbonization because social and economic uh, uh, researches show that it's absolutely obvious. Let's take a look at uh, the fact that once we have energy, then we've got en everything. We've got food production, and we've got the chance to systematically renew. But if we don't have energy, why? Well, that's a good question, and this is exactly what we are going to talk about. And now, let's talk to the ambassador of energy security, so Gábor Bajó Karotta. If we've got energy, we've got everything. But if we do not have energy, then we do not have anything. Well, I'm in a gondola, which is at a height of 110 meters, and here it's rotating. And if the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, then we have gas. And gas is just behind me in this huge vessel. That is actually natural gas in the pipeline that is flowing to the Republic of Croatia. Energy issue clearly is the most important subject matter of the present 
ever civilization. Hopefully, you have not fear of height, right? You went upstairs, right? Yes, actually, I wanted to go to the very top. Okay, so you do not have fear of heights, right? Okay, under certain circumstances, I have, but it's so cool. Have you been up there? No, no, no. Really, in a windmill, on top of the windmill, it's so good because you are inside and it's kind of noisy. There's the smell of oil, really, that's oily everything, and there is a generator, huge machine inside. But if you look at it from the outside, then it's a very nice and friendly something which is ro uh, rolling around, which is producing renewable energy. And there's a huge contrast between what you can see internally and externally. I liked it a great deal. OK, to what extent you are interested in this subject matter? I am very much interested, because I, as a human and I, as a father, am interested in this. And uh, in the past decades, I talked a lot about cars, mainly electric cars. So I, what I often hear is that, OK, OK, I understand that electric cars, but how can we produce all this energy, electric energy? And I like to give honest answers to these questions. And for that, I need to be able to find out from where we are going to have electric, all this electric energy on the one hand. But for that, we need a number of th things at the end of which we will have electric power, like wind and, and sun and, and nuclear power and fusion and all that, and gas, natural gas, so all that. And from where we can get all this, and what are we at, and to what extent it's good or bad. And so I enjoyed a great deal to deal with this issue. OK, so you've got lots of questions. I've got lots of questions as well. So let's meet the experts. Zoletnik Sándor, az Sándor Zoletnik, Zoletnik, he is an expert of fusion uh, research. He says that fusion uh, electric production is our dream, but it's a nightmare for the engineers. The temperature is 10 times as higher as, as you can imagine. At the same time, he is certain that the whole thing is doable and it's going to provide us with a very important energy resource. And Zoltán Zoletnik, is with us already, so he's a plasma researcher. Wow, it is even hard to give you to, to tell the title, but we are going to go into the details of what you are dealing with. And let's call the next expert. Dr. Szolnoki Pálma has been involved in environmental protection since childhood. She is committed to researching the possibilities of transforming the energy sector and greening it, and she believes it is important that it is accompanied by a process of democratization. This process helped to transform our energy supply, not only nationally, but also individually, from a situation of vulnerability and dependency to one of near self-sufficiency. Dr. Palma, Szolnoki, welcome. Hi, Palma, please take a seat. So let's start off with this. OK, we've got a gentleman here who has done a lot in his own life in electrification. So he's engaged in electrification. So what happened to you? So a, super, a, a gasoline car was transformed into electric car, right? That's what you did, right? Yes. And the veteran, an old-timer car, I uh, uh, transformed. And really, for many old-timer fa fans told me that oh, this is uh, just unacceptable what I did. But I believe that the way I'm trying to uh, familiarize this, them, myself with things is to is to do. So my original hobby is, uh, is uh, old-timers. OK. And you are you had been a fan of gasoline cars, right? And what happened? What made you change? In this sense, I didn't change. I still like those. Still, I think that it's not a good solution. They are not a good solution for transporting ourselves from A to B. So we need to completely dismantle the cultural and all the values associated with it, at the end of which we can extend our potential solutions to mankind and to the everyday life of mankind. And I massively believe that we need to let go of it as soon as possible, because simple as that, it's a bad solution. And even today, we can come up with better solutions uh, at a much broader scale. OK, in one sense, electric cars. OK, the electric car that you built is able to do exactly the same as the gasoline car? No. And at the moment, for a while, even electric car, uh, the use of electric cars cannot cover all the functions of the gasoline cars, because it's not done yet. It's not complete 
yet, but it can it is much better usable than what you might think. No, okay. okay then, let's start off here. Okay, electrification. How necessary, na- necessary is this? It is absolutely necessary. Electric cars, yes, I looked into electric cars, and they are not good for everything. Okay, but we are not talking about just cars, right? Electrification covers a whole lot of things in our lives. Yes, we have electricity all around. For example, we use natural gas for heating, but somewhere there are places where we use electric power for heating, so you can use anything. You can use electric power for anything. Pama, what do you think? But basically, we are in the middle of a decarbonization process, the basis of which is that we will change the consumption from fossil energy resources to electricity. This has two main reasons, one of which is that it's much more effective. What we experience in the case of cars is how much more energy efficiency can be reached or improve when switching to electric cars, but we will be able to do that in heating, for example, with the help of heat pumps, and this energy efficiency will be experienced there as well. The other main reason is that we can see it's already clear as a result of technological development that electric sector and electric power sector is something that we can very cheaply, relatively cheaply uh, electrify. So the main direction is electrification, and this will have a consequence that basically our whole consumption, each and every segment and aspect of our life will be switched to electric power, and this will raise some energy security well, exactly questions. Right. We've got huge plans, but how can we implement this? Okay, efficiency. Important from where we get the electricity, because you get this from a natural gas plant or from an oil plant, and the efficiency. Well, that's true, however. It is. It is the case, right? We, this is catch-22. The funny thing about this is that I think that this company competition is so awful and the efficiency is so bad that even, okay, if partly foresight, so it's not like the windmill is directly connected to the electric car, just think of the energy mix of Hungary, we, and we can cover 44% of the needs at Paksh, the nuclear power plant, which is great, and one, one quarter is gas, it is relied on gas, and, and you charge a car with this, so it's practically one quarter, 25 percent of uh, the consumption that can be reduced, because this is, this is that's the difference in the efficiency of the drivetrain. And actually, what makes me really sad, the sadness of my profession, is that it's not sexy to, to talk about uh, these. For, for example, when I had a huge engine, a V8, and I just drove away like that, then that was really an unparalleled uh, experience. I'm sorry, but, but, but that's... This is how we contributed to the devastation of the Earth. But that was sexy, and it ought to come up with an expectable explanation that it's much more important to electrify things and to decarbonize things. So what it means is that we are trying to match these two things, which is kind of impossible. Let me add something to this. The aim is for electric power to be decarbonized from renewable energy. that if we use the gas plant, for producing energy, electric energy, then what's the efficiency? Exactly, this is my point. So, yeah, it, it makes a difference from where we can get the electric power. Okay, let me give you this. Uh, energy sector is responsible for two-thirds of the CO2 emission at the moment. So how could we change that? This is exactly what we are talking about. This is a very important message here. Obviously, different resources need to be used. Renewables need to be used, uh, nuclear energy need to be used, and if you look up the sky, uh, that's something which is giving us the light, and where we, from where we can get infinite power. Okay, we're in the fusion, right, in the fusion plant. Okay, we need to work on the fusion plant. Okay, so roughly we are at a point that theoretically uh, the plans are done, are complete, we know everything for the uh, solution, but it's very hard to implement. Is, that, is this the point? Well, we've advanced a lot. So when we raise 
raised the decarbonization of the electric sector earlier, we didn't know what technology we will use and whether we can do it cost efficiently. And what we have to see that in the last decade, there has been a technological revolution. For example, we can now ask the youngsters, because you probably were, weren't electric power purchasers back then, so whether in 2010, how much more fresh, um, more costly there was so raise to your use hand electric if you power think in 2010. That, uh, it was really to expensive electric, to use uh, energy. 2010, Let's some to, use, uh, to, use to use solar power two times, two times more expensive than the market price, price. Of, who would market think that? Price. So uh, let me mention the alternatives. Five times, five times, times, ten five times. Or, ten, or ten times? Okay, okay, two who times? would vote for two times? Really but it was two times They are still not paying for uh, electricity. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you say that they are not uh, able okay, to calculate. Five times right? more expensive? Please, and ten times. <laughs> Ten, ten times, that's very expensive. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. It was actually, ten times, actually, to produce the electric power with solar plants back in 2010, which was actually produced by plants yes, very, based on fossil energy. Coal, right? And from that very high level, high price, in a, a period of ten years, Years, the cost of solar panel energy reduced so much that today, today the market price of that technology is competitive. Let's look at the capacity solar panel, uh, solar plants, capacity building. Since 2009, it was like an explosion. For example, when using solar plants on households, for example, uh, on the top of family yeah, houses, but it's not gonna solve there are also problems. plenty yeah, solar plants. And that's the big question. Because right? the weather sort of, uh, comes into play. Use. They say that, well, my house is not generating because the weather is not really good for weeks now. Uh, are we, aren't we too dependent uh, when yes, it comes exactly. to this? So here we have the technological source. competition, and this was won by solar and wind, which are weather dependent energy resources that we won't produce when we turn on our laptop back in our homes or television, but when we have these resources available. So we have to solve that problem so that consumption and production will become in balance in our electric uh, sector. And then the, the uh, next challenge is up, the decarbonization of that process, how we can do that. Um, flexibility is the password right now in electric sector because flexibility is something, flexibility capacity. That means that we can change our consumption if needed or we can reduce our production or with the help of storage system, we can support that balance. We can achieve the result that the consumption and production will get in balance, or that the daily production of course, will be focused it has its on a night yeah, consumption. Summer and winter, it's not really working. So when it comes to my winter heating, uh, we actually need yes, 800 exactly. car batteries. So that's a problem. And the second second problem that I would like to raise, even if we can balance this out, what happens if there is a climate change it happens, right? Volcanic eruptions are happening regularly, for example, which change the climate for decades. So renewable sources are great, we have to use them, but besides that we need resources that we can regulate. And I think that's the point where we should listen to the theoretical physicist of New York City College, uh, Michio Kaku. Here and now, and you know, solar power and wind power, it's competitive. It's actually competitive in the market. But who would have thought? People thought it was something for futurists that, that daydream that it was not real. Now it's real. It's in our backyards now. So that's the short term. But we have to look at the long term implications too. And so uranium power yeah, was a disappointment. But hydrogen power, fusion power is still on the table. No meltdown danger. If there's a problem with the fusion reactor, it just shuts off. That's what happened. No nuclear waste. Think about that. A, a uranium nuclear power plant creates 30 tons of nuclear waste per year per reactor. One reactor creates 30 tons of nuclear waste per year per reactor, while fusion power has almost no nuclear waste at all. It's the power of the sun 
And the, the sun has waste products. It's called helium. And helium is actually commercially valuable. You can sell he helium. And so we see a sea change long term if fusion pans out. So we heard a couple of interesting uh, possibilities, for example, fusion uh, power, what's that? Uh, solar power, basically uh, all of the stars are using that. Uh, that's the basic process. There are, uh, there, there are different fusion processes, but basic one is, uh, is the one used by the star. We see that in the background, that's some type of fusion power. Basically, we have to bring uh, the sun down to earth and box it somehow. Why are we not switching to fusion uh, power uh, right now? Basically, the, the main big problem is, uh, is the temperature. Uh, so somehow we have to uh, bring uh, 100 uh, million Celsius uh, source into a box. We can do that somehow. Somehow there are similar devices, uh, but uh, but there are issues. So currently we do not have a fusion power plant. No, currently we do not have that. We hope that, let's say, in 30 years uh, we will have one. I've been hearing that for quite some time now. But you know we are getting closer. Uh, hopefully uh, some of the kids here uh, may be interested in that uh, as uh, as a thesis for the degree. But I would like to add that even if the first fusion power plant is constructed, we need decades uh, to reach or to achieve some impact on, on planet Earth. Because here we have huge investment costs, and once we have to build thousands of those around the world, uh, then we do not have the industry, the resources, the devices, tool, equipment needed for that. So this decade or this century, we need renewable sources and nuclear power. Absolutely. Yes, if you look at the countries, the countries must prepare some climate plan for years now. And we and the neighboring countries have voted to do so. That is, what I, uh, that is our direction to use solar, wind, and nuclear energy. And returning to the other topic, yes, the, the next challenge of decarbonization is how to become flexible within the day. There are some plans to do so in some directions. I won't go into details. But the big challenge that we do not have the uh, major technology uh, is the season, seasonal storage. So let's think about if our heating is also electrifi ele electrified, then that kind of heating need that are now supplied out of gas, 80% of Hungarian gas consumption is consumed in the winter. So to put that onto the electric system, electric energy system, how we will uh, provide that with solar solar or wind energy, because the uh, theory is that we should uh, produce more in the spring, in the summer, and autumn, and then we can store that and, and use it in the winter. There are some hydrogen projects, there are some that are promising, but we don't have true solutions. There are some open questions. No, I, I do not want to hijack the message here, but I think that it's really important that once we say that 80% of the gas demand here in Hungary are used for heating, and simultaneously we are talking about electrification, then, then it's uh, really interesting because basically only a quarter of this current 80% uh, is is needed to, or has have to be covered because we can do it much more efficiently uh, once we are starting using uh, electrification. And uh, this way we are actually needing much much less uh, electricity. Of course, we need more electricity than currently uh, because we would like to cover heating from electric uh, sources as well, but uh, proportionately we need less uh, because we are more efficient. Uh, and uh, actually, when it comes to nuclear power plant, uh, the, uh, once again, uh, we are much more efficient with that, and we have to find renewable 
resources as well. We are talking about generation of energy and storing that energy. And I would like to bring in one more aspect, decentralization, what we can do individually or what we can do as a business, the enterprise sector, what can they do? What we need to see is that these weather dependency, solar and wind technologies uh, are the winners right now, but these have uh, the characteristics that they can be stored in very small amount, and that would make them already e uh, economic, and the, the operation thereof do not require any uh, expertise. So, for example, residents could actually um, function and impose those energy, solar energy, for example, and that means that consumers themselves can actually provide their own energy supply, and this is a very novel story, very new story. Before the 90s, a typical story was that electric power supply could only supplied by one vertical monopole uh, um, company. And then with diversification, of course, uh, multinational companies came into the picture. But then a for-profit supply is something that we talk about, where the, what the consum consumers look at from within and can pay for the bill, but we are not part of it. But with this possibility uh, provided by these new technologies, consumers can become a part of that whole process. In fact, in the future, not only those uh, fortunate can become a part of it who have the uh, family house, but any consumer. So the EU regulation uh, points at, to that direction that would mean that I can actually share my production with my neighbor. Uh, the residents of one block of flats could actually cooperate and, and share and, and distribute the solar energy that is produced on the roof of their block of flats, or they can create a solar park, a solar uh, energy uh, power plant. This sounds great, right? But now we see all these regulatory changes. Yes, it is not as simple. So it's quite complicated. There are so many actors who would like to be Absolutely. involved. But this is something that we work a lot on. But what we have to see is that the whole thing will get a totally new fundamentum. The electricity, the electric power will get a new um, base. So those new terms that consumers themselves can provide for their own energy need and can create these energy communities. The EU plans that by 2030, solar and wind plans, the capacity there of fifth, uh, one fifth of, of that capacity will be owned by such consumers. So a decentralization process is ongoing and consumers will be able to partake into their own energy sovereignty. What happens if an individual is very rich and they would like to be involved in the business? For example, in the US, uh, space exploration is not only up to NASA, NASA but for example, Elon Musk uh, and SpaceX is moving faster than state. Is it possible to be involved in the energy sector uh, as, as a private enterprise? And now, uh, around the world, we have more money in, in private uh, fusion research than in, in state-funded research, and that's big money. If we are talking about six billion US dollars, that's the estimate, mostly in Northern America. Uh, is it worth it? Some of them are definitely fake companies who go under in 10 years, but some of them are legit companies. Yeah. And they are working on industrial developments, which were not there in 10 years ago. And they are using these new developments to, to move faster. It doesn't necessarily mean that they get there sooner, but they are definitely going to develop technologies which we can use, not only in the field of fusion, but in other areas as well. Uh, many industrial developments are coming from there, uh, such as internet, uh, space exploration are coming from the military, where there was a concentrated demand. Do you think, Palma, that a company is going to build a fusion plant sooner? Are we uh, going to build uh, 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 some kind of 
a spaceship which will use, for example, solar energy and bring it down to planet Earth, because then uh, we are not dependent on the weather. Frankly, I have no idea which has Quite interesting uh, how we imagine 2050. What do you think? What's going to happen? What do you think? Uh, will we have a fusion plant by 2050? Do you think that it's going to be possible? Yes. You are not quite you know, certain about that. It's hard to imagine that. What do you think? Where will we be in 2050? Is that a difficult question? Well, yeah, I think uh, there are going to be, let's say, demo devices. But uh, I think that uh, a private uh, fusion company already sold an optional rights uh, for Microsoft. Karotova, do you think? I I think that by 2050, AI is somehow going to decide this question. And now let's listen to our New York expert. Now we're talking science fiction, which I love, but a type one civilization is planetary. They control the ocean, they control the weather, they control anything planetary, that is type one. Type two civilization is stellar. They control the power of a star. They use energy directly from the sun. That's type two. And then we have type three, which gets their energy from the galaxy. They, they are a galactic civilization. Now on that scale, are we type one that control uh, the weather, that control resources on the earth, type two that control the sun, type three that control the galaxy? No, we're type, we're type zero. Oh. We're just beginning. We are children. We are children on the scale, but I think by the end of the century, we will become type one. That is, we will be planetary by the end of this century. We will have planetary power, controlling the weather, for example. We'll talk about global warming as if it was past tense rather than future tense. And so we'll be a planetary civilization by the end of the century. We'll control global warming. We'll control the food supply. And all the, the kinks and bottlenecks will be eliminated when we become a type one civilization, which is truly planetary. Very optimistic. Do you agree? Well, I also hope that we will be over global warming, the problem of global warming by then. Whether we can rule the weather, well, that's a question. Well, yeah, that's an issue, but uh, for that we need energy. So energy is key. So if we want to actively extract CO2 out of the atmosphere, for all, for all that you need energy. Energy that doesn't generate waste, CO2, right? Otherwise it would make no sense. So that's, that's the direction. Uh, this is a double-edged sword again. So on the one hand, you are saying as a scientist that by the end of the century, human civilization will surely uh, have been solved to the issue of global warming and the access to energy on a planetary scale. Actually, this is, this is something easy to say, easy to utter, because it, it, it's either possible or not. So perhaps it's not going to happen at all. Uh, young, one thing is sure, we are not there yet. The upcoming subject matter is going to be climate change, and even there we, are, we will touch upon some very interesting cornerstones. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. It was an honor. Thank you for uh, walking uh, all these distances, and we will continue with the MVM Future Talks very shortly.
Elérkeztünk a 2023-as so future utolsó to the last subject matter of our future talks which is climate change. Köszönöm, köszönöm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gyors so very quickly a survey. Közületek azt gondolja, uh, who thinks that it's up to us? We are the fault. We are the reason for the climate change. This, this is due to human activity. And the majority says so. All right then. Yes, because there's different di uh, opinions on this. I think this is one of the biggest subject, ma uh, subject matter about which there is the heated debate. If you look at the latest summer of ours, then I think we can say that if the trend continues, then perhaps that was our coolest, coldest summer. And in the future, all we will have if, uh, is a uh, hotter and hotter summer. There is floods, uh, fire, uh, wildfire, heat waves uh, going on in countries, in areas which it was not typical. Or maybe it was typical even earlier. Um, um, rivers flooded, um, um, the cities in Europe. Europe, we will find it up. One thing is sure that there is climatic and health and economic impacts of climate change. So it is visible for all of us. Climate change is visible for all of us. So the MVM Future Talks ambassador is Chobi Magyarosi, who went and traveled to the most of the places in order to uncover these endpoints. In Europe, we will never have this. Right? Yet. From here to there, the level, the glacier level dropped in the last 30 years. Sea level is constantly on the rise, 20 centimeters in the last 100 years. And the problem is that the majority of this 20 centimeter is the result of the last one or two decades. Sooner or later, we will see the signs which will give us a forecast of a complete devastation. But actually, these signs have been present for many years in the Maldives. Orca, the very first high-performance CO2 neutralizing plant. This it extracts CO2 from the air. And here you can see and hear the noise of the air getting cleaned. Csaba Magyarosi, content producer. Hey, Csabi, I realize that I want to be you. How come that you visit so many good people? You don't want to be me, really, because if you look at from your perspective, then it's very entertaining, but truly, it is very, very busy. Yes, you visited many beautiful places, right? OK, so what have you found? Have you found what you were looking for? I was, uh, um, I was kind of suspicious. Uh, it was kind of suspicious that I'm going to see the whole thing all over the place. So, for example, the glaciers disappear and the water will appear somewhere else. And this is exactly the very point of the project, to see the different sides, the different endpoints of the same process. So there is heat and there is cold. Wherever it's cold, how cold is this? Wherever there are islands, are there are those islands still there? So these were the questions we were looking into. OK, and how did all this impact you? Because you witnessed the number of things. And what is your own opinion? of what you have seen. I actually, um, I actually think that we should believe the experts, and experts have been saying for quite some time that there is trouble around the co and what's more, the trouble is here with us and here to stay. So there is nothing surprising of what I found, but what was so shocking is that really it's physically there, and I come across, I came across people who, <clears throat> for example, visited the Alps and walked on, hiked on glaciers, and they returned to the same place and not just did it pull back, but did the drama on their faces that 10 years ago I was here on the top of the glacier and there is a sign showing that in 12 and in 2012 there was the glacier. And somewhere in the distance you can see where the glacier is at the moment. So these are dramatic changes and it's very hard to face these changes, but these underline what experts have been saying for decades, that these phenomena uh, 
cannot be denied anymore, and they are here to stay with us. Okay, did, did many questions uh, show up during your travels? Well, uh, yes, and at the same time, we are try I'm always trying to find answers to these questions. Yeah, okay, I'm bringing you some experts. Okay, so let's meet these experts. Mati Litkai, director of the Climate Policy Institute at Matthias Corvinus Collegium. His work focuses on the social dimensions of sustainability, as he believes that science only creates choices, but that decision-making is always through social processes. He is looking for unconventional solutions and believes that climate change needs pragmatism rather than dogma. Vig Peter, a másfél Peter Vig, founding editor of Másfél, former climate policy advisor. The main objective of his scientific outreach work is to activate rather than uh, making you apathic. He is convinced that we can make the necessary and otherwise fully achievable changes if we understand that they will make life better for all of us. And at least keep our environment and climate livable and predictable. He says, science is not a matter of faith or political will, but Action is a matter of science and science, and it is up to, up to us. Welcome. So, welcome, dear experts. So let's jump into the midst of it. We've got data. One of the data is that we've got that 1.5 degrees, that global average temperature uh, elevation, right? We all accept this. We look at it as a fact that this this, this happens. This is uh, and what we what uh, what it means is under debate, right? This 1.5 degrees what we often mention is kind of a target value. We set this target value so that we looked at the period of the industrialization and we would like to return to the previous era, and according to agreement, uh, we should achieve a reduction of possibly two degrees, but at least 1.5. 1.5 is not a lot, right? Why is it a tragedy? Yes, but this is an average, an average elevation of temperature. And obviously, throughout the globe, there is there is more uh, elevation, elevations which will be higher, and there will be less. But the effects, the impacts, uh, are the extreme weather conditions. So if you look at uh, this, uh, temperature change and due to the heat due to the extension uh, of matter due to heat uh, what is the volume of that so these impacts directly affect our lives um, I do not like to go into the figures and numbers of maths so whenever we are talking about climate change I'm trying to translate it into everyday language so this 1.5 degrees is not affect the audience, the neighbor, what affects us is what, how our lives will look like 10, 15 or 30 years from now. So this 1.5 degrees is an important number. Whenever we talk about this 1.5 degrees, in policy making, mitigation is emphasized. What does that mean? It means how can we reduce additional warming by not emitting additional volumes, amounts of uh, greenhouse gases. And there's another uh, strategy which is not looked at uh, a lot, adaptation, how we could adapt to the already changed the environment. I think that in the short run, we should put bigger emphasis on that for a number of reasons. One is that it's more, much more cost efficient in number of, for example, the irrigation system, to build the irrigation system as opposed to making changes in the climate. Number one. Number two is that this train passed by. So even if we manage to reduce our emission to zero, still it has an impetus, a momentum, uh, so that it's going to carry on, and even for many decades to come, for decades to come, uh, we will continue warming up, and then we will uh, reduce the temperature if we are successful. Okay, so this is 1.5 degrees on 1.6 degrees. So 0.1 degrees, what does that mean globally? You mentioned that it seemed to be very little, especially in such a studio, uh, which is air-conditioned, but it's not like a butcher's desk. So, for example, you ask for a meat, okay, it's 1.5 or 1.8 kilograms, and can we keep it like that? No, every 0.1 matters. 
because our memories are short, but do can we recall the uh, most severe draft of last year? So whenever we talk about this point once, and we are talking about the fact that out of these extreme weather conditions, we will, we will have very impactful lives in terms of energy production, infra maintenance of our infrastructure, food production, etc. Not to mention the fact that it's going to happen to us somewhere in the distance. <coughs> so it's like, it's, it's just a little uh, more unpleasant. But it's not just that. Okay, so we are drying out, we are warming up. And actually these effects are adding up and it's going exponential. And here and now we can find ourselves in a much worse situation than people thousands of kilometers far from now. It's not like a roulette wheel that I'm going to bet for the black or the red and then I turn the wheel. No, this threshold value of 1.5 in the Paris Agreement word by word, so that two degrees, trying to achieve two degrees, but, but at least 1.5 degrees uh, until the end of the century. But... <coughs> But it is kind of a, a, a value to which we should align ourselves because we do not have another turn on the roulette wheel. So perhaps we will not have a future in the civilization. This is exactly what it was hard to understand. So it's like you want to um, fix an aircraft which is still on the fly, but everyone is saying that it's going to fall. It's going to, it's going to fall to the ground. So is it irreversible? What is irreversible with regards to weather conditions, uh, yes, there are tipping points. Uh, after some time, we will be unable uh, to reverse. But looking at the social effects, so for example, if there is a constant change in the weather conditions and what the impacts will be, we don't know. I agree with you in the sense that it's important to adapt. But we should not face, we should not uh, oppose it with the mitigation targets because you cannot adopt to any something which you do not know. We do not know what's going on in terms of changes and what the impacts will be. Yes, there are inevitable and irreversible changes to which we need to adapt. But if we, if we remove CO2 emission reductions of the uh, on the, uh, of the agenda, then uh, it's exactly the adaptation that we will sabotage. So we should never, ever uh, put it into opposite directions. We should keep our focus on both. Okay, so this is a counter or timer. What is this? What do you think? So this is the global average temperature, so around 15 uh, Celsius. But you see that the number keeps changing, how, and it shows how this temperature is rising constantly. But Peter said, I would like to uh, add a few things there. I also do not think that adaptation and mitigation should be uh, opposites. But I would like to say that uh, the same uh, environment environmental impacts will have completely different effects uh, in different societies. So once we, for example, talk about greenhouse gas emissions and the fact that we have to reduce that, that's uh, not a question. There is a global consensus. There are a couple of countries which say that it's not important and they are not willing. Uh, usually they are the biggest uh, emitters, but no, actually that's not true. For example, the Paris Agreement was one of the biggest achievements achievements was that uh, all the U.S. stepped out, but then joined once again during the Biden administration. Countries that matter are actually involved in the Paris Agreement, and if we check the quotas and what some people or some uh, parties uh, win and lose uh, in the transition in or in this transaction, uh, it also involves uh, that, for example, China and India 
Kandyan says that uh, we have different uh, social matters which, uh, where I would like to spend my money. For example, uh, eradicating uh, poverty, for example. So they say that I could manage uh, cutting greenhouse gas emissions uh, in 10 years' time, but I have different priorities. And the main question is, what kind of deal can we offer to them so they do not have to give up anything? For example, Harari says, uh, the author Harari, uh, professional uh, historian, basically, he says that 2% of the world's GDP would be enough to solve this whole issue. That's a rather brave statement, because that seems rather cheap, right? 2%. Uh, just for context, two uh, percent, for example, is uh, something that NATO expects uh, the member state uh, to spend on military. For example, five percent is something a welfare state spends on education and healthcare. The real question is whether they are, the country is willing to spend it on this matter, or they want to build infrastructure, build uh, windmills, build. Uh, education and schools. So, for example, uh, I can uh, uh, meet different kinds of social demand. Why is it important they can catch up? Because once the disaster happens, it's there. Natural disaster happens. Uh, it creates less damage in a welfare state than in a third world country, simply because they are more prepared, uh, simply because they can save lives, they can end and they can also save the natural environment. Let's imagine an earthquake, an earthquake where there are no strict building code, uh, where corruption is high, where there are no cultural uh, tradition of construction. They are using light structures. It's going to create much more devastation than in more developed countries. And that's the same goes for climate change disasters, because a more developed society means less damage when it comes to a climate disaster. So uh, mitigation and adaptation, adaptation are not opposites, but we have to provide opportunities for third world countries. Let me add one more data, because uh, the countries of the world spend 7 trillion US dollars uh, to, uh, to fossil fuel industry. So they are spending much more on uh, on something which uh, which is not really sustainable. There are lots of data on this. For example, since the Paris Agreement, we spent uh, support on support uh, for the fossil fuel industry, which uh, would solve this energy transition. But uh, so some change is required. And here there are actual uh, new developments. For example, in Iceland, uh, you've seen the Orca, the world's biggest uh, vacuum cleaner, basically. Uh, I, I see that uh, it uh, removes uh, 4,000 tons uh, of CO2 from the atmosphere. Here is the Orca, uh, the world's first large-scale CO2 uh, uh, neutralizing plant, which removes CO2 from the air. And here you hear uh, the word getting cleaner. And uh, actually, it works in a simple way. Uh, they are using fans uh, to heat up the air, and then they remove CO2. And the CO2 is then mixed with water and basalt. And the end result is that air no longer uh, has CO2 in it. And then it's actually in a soluted form in the lock layer. And here we see that uh, there are separate units working and all together we can remove 4,000 tons of CO2 from the air. And then if we calculate it for cars, how much fuel they use, uh, we can say that uh, it removes 4,000 cars worth of fuel consumption and CO2 emissions uh, from the air. This is not really a big number, but actually that's just the trial uh, period. And, uh, 
practice shows that the plant works. And now they are already working on a more advanced uh, solution called Mammoth, uh, which is going to start operations soon. And then it can remove 36,000 tons of CO2 uh, from the air. But uh, this 10 times uh, uh, proportion uh, is uh, is hopefully feasible, and they will would like to uh, keep this trade up uh, and trend up, and then by 2050 they would like to achieve a gigatons. Uh, of CO2 nem, removed nem, from nem, the air. Nem, nem is, amikor... so, so, the uh, voices, uh, you know, you can already hear this vacuum cleaner in the background. Is that a solution? There are millions of vacuum cleaners like this, uh, so noisy and loud. Yeah, so the solution is definitely more complex. We have to reduce uh, emissions, reduce uh, energy consumption, we have to use new types of plants, but this is part of the puzzle, uh, and it may uh, play a role in this one and a half Celsius degrees. Uh, we know what we should achieve, and it's you know getting harder and harder to uh, meet this uh, target number, but the main thing is that we need different uh, puzzle pieces to meet this goal. Is it possible that in the future where uh, we can use technology to solve to, to solve uh, the problem of climate change. There is no silver bullet here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the scientists may have an opinion on, uh, on political issues, and then they can say what kind of policies uh, they would like to use, and uh, then the politicians can realize that. For example, uh, the IPCC, of the UN also considers it important to use uh, uh, coal uh, CO2 extraction uh, methods, carbon extraction methods. And uh, why is that it what featured in Chaba's videos? And Elon Musk also says that they are willing to uh, donate for the best uh, possible solution. And technology is always sexy. And once we say that you should put up insulation, install insulation in your home, that's not sexy, but actually it would be a quite efficient solution. Uh, that's, that's the best uh, uh, sector. Uh, where we can implement change in Hungary, uh, the building industry, the construction industry. So we have to prioritize well. And once again, the investment should reflect these priorities. This doesn't mean that Orca or Mammut or the whale in the future, I don't know the next imaginary name would be. We need these, but we have to prioritize. And yeah, there are sexy and not so sexy topics. And I think the potential here is that uh, this one and a half Celsius uh, uh, can be achieved if we move back uh, to uh, a cave and, uh, and start cooking plants, of course. So we have to, of course, uh, take on some compromises. But if we do smart design, that's true for a household or a country. And we have to take a look at this globally, because one of my favorite uh, examples, counter examples, is that uh, some countries are really uh, proudly saying uh, how they decrease CO2 emissions. And then we realize that they move their industry to a different country where the CO2 emissions uh, increase. And so we have to take a global look at this. And this whole transition may be less uncomfortable than we, may, than we may think at first. But still, here we are talking about two big topics, whether we change our habits, whether we change uh, our business logic, or whether we develop something new which will help to reduce our CO2 emissions. Uh, would that be a solution if we could uh, reduce CO2 emissions? 
Egy would that be a solution? Yes, but on the other hand, if we had a big red button, and if I push that, and if I manage to uh, stop CO2 emission right away, even then, as, as it was said, there is a, uh, still something in the system as a result of which we will still have changes in the next two decades. Minden. Hát igen, de van, amikor megbetegszünk, és akkor tényleg teszünk az egészségünkért, pedig lehet, hogy megelőzhettük volna. Te például hiszel abba, Máté, hogy... Oké, okay, understand, but Máté, uh, perhaps uh, the time will come when we will need a bigger crisis, so that uh, the mankind would uh, be uh, ready to make a decision. Actually, it often happens to us that we are slapped, and then we are ready to make the appropriate decisions and take the uh, actions. So, for example, think of the draft, and as a, as a consequence of the draft, farmers made decisions and took actions, etc. Of course, irrigation does not solve all the problems because it's about water retention, etc., etc., but the point I'm making that we needed something that made a result. So we need something bad as a result of which we are ready to take an action, right? And, uh, and, and do things differently. So perhaps we are overcritical towards mankind. The fact that we managed to reach a consensus in this is something, is an achievement. And 99% of the audience agrees with me that some sort of actions need to be taken. Perhaps we do disagree in terms of what uh, actions need to be taken and what you are ready to sacrifice in your lives, but we have a consensus as to uh, changes need to be made. From community levels, the potential uh, actions will be different, and there is no silver bullet. I agree with you. Perhaps in India, uh, the, di the difference need to be made, the, 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 the change need to be made, that, for example, irrigation need to uh, carry out a, a, a change, or, for example, in Holland, uh, due to the elevation of the sea level, uh, some other uh, actions need to be taken. The point I'm making is that there is no universal solution. Gratu Professor, what is your view? And terraforming is one of the biggest things you can do because you're talking about changing the earth and changing the weather and changing the soil and reformulating the entire planet, okay? Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, instead of terraforming, we can't even terraform a city, let alone the entire planet Earth. But it's good to think this way. Because in some sense, we have already terraformed the Earth in a bad way. We have changed the climate of the Earth. So in that sense, we have already terraformed the Earth to a degree by making it hotter, by making it more polluting. And so in that sense, yes, we have already terraformed the Earth in a bad way. Now we have to reverse that. We have to terraform the Earth in a good way so that we can reverse carbonization so that we can reverse the greenhouse effect, that would be an accomplishment, not a terraforming for to make the earth hotter, but a terraforming to save us from the first terraforming. No, hát... Uh... Well then, az, hogy hogyan formálódik how a föld, az the planet is forming, getting formed, to what extent it impacts us. Okay, <clears throat> so how we lose forests, right? This is easy to understand. This is always in the news, and we are always uh, feeling negatively about it. What does this mean? We cannot uh, survive without space, without having space. This is so self-evident. So, self so whatever surrounds us impacts us. So if I was near a forest, and let me go a bit personal, I was raised near a forest. And if they cut the forest and the forest disappears, then it's going to impact me to such an extent that it may result in a degree of mourning. So this is actually something which is described by psychologists. This exists. 
So if there's a natural disaster, there's devastation, then you will feel like as if you lost a friend or a relative because lots of childhood memories were attached to you, the forest, that you climbed up the trees, you picked apples, etc. And you don't have that anymore. So whatever you had earlier disappears or may disappear. And this is exactly why I think that this local patriotic view that you uh, are part of a place, that you settled somewhere, you raise your kids somewhere, and you are responsible for that space. That helps us a great deal in uh, protecting our environment. Because if that's yours, then you will not let go of that place. Actually, the biggest forests are uh, devastated. Uh, and those people who live there are never asked. Yes, actually, what's interesting here is that oftentimes something big or little happens somewhere, and we believe that it's a problem of theirs. So when we were in the Maldives, and uh, experts talked stories about the fish dying out. So if you are in corals, coral reefs, and he was describing uh, how important his work was, then he said that it's going to vanish. All this is going to vanish. He cannot stop because it's not up to them. And then you may think, okay, this is unpleasant. Coral reef will disappear. And okay, the rich Europeans and Americans will not go there. They will not sip their cocktails there. But it's not just that. Even the locals will be unable to stay there. They will need to leave their country. They will need to leave their islands. And not just that, that in the midst of the Indian Ocean, you need to leave. But actually, the whole ecosystem system will turn upside down, and the Indian Ocean, the whole area will be affected, because one plant and one uh, natural habitat affects the other. And that will result in the change of tens of millions of people. So you cannot pick a little element which will not result in a domino effect. Okay, and what do we have to do with this, right? Because many... That there is global responsibility taking, and this is not contradicting local responsibility taking. So, after a degree of knowledge, we all will realize that we are interconnected, we are intertwined with all these advantages and disadvantages. So, we live in a global community, and what can you do uh, in order to make a difference, a positive difference <coughs> in the Amazonas? And if you for example, purchase something, a chicken breast, in the local supermarket, then perhaps that chicken was fed by soya that was uh, produced in Brazil. So the point I'm making is that we have responsibility locally and globally, and whatever we do here will affect Brazil. OK, you were talking to people. What did you experience? How much people deal with, with these issues? They deal with these issues. This is everywhere on the table, wherever I go. Actually, my place was special. And wherever I go, it's raining. Right? <coughs> Even at the driest part, it's raining. So this is part of my job. But the other extreme is that we find ourselves in amazing storms, scary storms, and more and more often. But 10 or 20 years ago, it was less common that you find yourself in a storm uh, the next moment. And locals see that, feel that, and they talk about this, uh, talk their stories, and they are less and less potent in dealing with these issues. And what you were saying, that we should fix the aircraft and why it's flying, okay, but, uh, but the engine started to smoke, right? Okay, wherever you are, in Hungary, in Italy, in the US, in Australia, you see, you sense the impact, so you don't find a place where you do not get impacted, okay? So you go there, <clears throat> you go to places where there are big mountains, and they, you go to uh, people in the Alps, and they are looking around, and really they got tears in their eyes saying that, okay, this will disappear in five years. But this is a cultural issue, right? Uh, because he's saying because, because that's what he got used to. And then what? If the environment changes, 
Okay. What if the environment will be different and we will still not die? Is this a valid scenario? Yes, but we can lose a great deal. So none of us thinks that although we have some positive developments, we know, we understand that we do not do enough. At the same time, no one of us talks about the complete extinction of mankind. But the civilization, the ecosystem that we currently live in, and to which we can be grateful, in this form, we can say goodbye to that, unless we do something. And again, biodiversity, the same applies to that. So that masterpiece that was created by nature in millions of years will vanish. And you cannot uh, do it back. You cannot reverse the whole process. You, you, you as a technocrat, will be unable to make a difference. And this is, you've got a huge responsibility in that. Yes, and the issue that you should make sacrifices in their convenience so that in the future we should have something that reminds us of what we currently have, or later we will have to make bigger sacrifices. Okay, yes, uh, perhaps the mankind will disappear and the nature will come back and they will rear and the nature will rearrange itself, right? It is, it is very well possible. Okay, we will see. The political anyway, okay, setting politics and everything aside, we are here, individuals. What can we do? Okay, so let's start from there. Do you have? Uh, responsibility. And can you do anything? Yes, and in a number of levels. One is to get, in, uh, get informed. Make sure that you are conscious about what the problem is. And uh, inform about what you can do. The next level is that, for example, if got talented young people around us, and we are in the lack of situation to talk about this issue, and they say, OK, I recognize the problem, and in my career path, I will take a role. For example, I, as an economist, an engineer, um, an attorney, or a lawyer, or a psychologist, I will make a difference in pushing mankind to the right direction. So through my profession, I can contribute to the solution. And as a next level, to make changes in our lifestyle. For example, how you do your shopping, because when, when you spend your money, you practically vote. So that's the other level of responsibility. These three levels of responsibility should be taken into account. And, and actually, that applies to any kind of social problem. Getting informed what you can do as an individual through your career path, and what can you do as an average person. OK, so is it a problem if we are wasting? Yes, it is a problem that we are wasting. But I kind of feel that uh, I don't think you as an individual can make a difference. OK, we must make every effort, but I think point number three is most important. Whenever you vote, and whenever you vote, you spend your money and vote. And when we achieve the critical mass, then we will enforce and force systems and ecosystems to carry out a change. And that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, most likely going to happen. What do you think? Is this uh, an individual responsibility? Do we have any option? Yeah, I think I would rather talk about the options, possibilities, chances ahead of the individual, because I would not uh, want to, I do not want to overburden the individual, because I do not want to start everyone off on this guilt trip. Uh, again, I would like to uh, quote the UN institution, which said in this latest report that uh, actually 40% uh, of the emission reductions target can be achieved by individual habit changes if there are systemic changes behind that. Because if you would like to live a more sustainable, greener life, that's usually difficult uh, uh, or too expensive or sometimes even impossible because we are not living in systems uh, which make this change easier. And uh, that's why uh, I agree with Chaba. We, we have to demand uh, the system to push this through us as well. So we should create established systems where it's easier to, all the, to do all this, to, to do all the action which is required. Uh, and then 
But for this, we need system level changes, incentives, motivational changes. And now let's listen to a global closing uh, thought uh, from Mr. Kaku. I think that by the year 2100, if all goes well, we will become a planetary civilization, a civilization that irons out its problems on a planetary scale, something that didn't exist just a few decades ago. But I think that's where we are headed. We are headed toward a type one civilization that is a planetary civilization where, where problems are, are argued and thought through on a planetary scale. That's the future. Uh, I, for me, it's quite easy to you know, adapt uh, to a positive future. Uh, I think we have a lot to do, but we have achieved a lot as humankind. It's really hard to close this conversation. It's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to close this conversation by saying that it's going to be a disaster. I think there are positive things ahead. This was MVM Future Talks. Uh, we talked about climate change. Change in the last uh, session, the, uh, the debate is going to continue in the next decades, and uh, hopefully we are going to achieve a solution by the end of the century. Let's hope for that. Thank you very much for your attention.